Hey, this is Pastor Jay Lee, and you're listening to the Daily Sabbath Podcast. Hey guys, Pastor Jay here. Welcome to another questions episode of the Daily Sabbath Podcast. And I want to wish a happy Thanksgiving to those of you guys who are listening from the U.S., If you're not from the U.S., basically Thanksgiving is the holiday where Americans watch football on TV. That's American football, not football as it's probably known in your country. And we eat turkey with cranberry sauce and mashed potatoes with gravy. So that's basically what you need to know about Thanksgiving. But in today's episode, we are asking the question, what can research tell us about spiritual growth? And I'm not going to lie, today we have got a heavy hitter for you guys. My special guest today is Dr. Dave Wang, who is a psychologist, a professor, a researcher, a pastor. I mean, I mean, you'll hear my intro of Dr. Wang in the interview, but just let me tell you, his resume is just unbelievable. And you know, honestly, it's very rare that you have a chance to talk to someone who is one of the experts in their field of study. And Dr. Wang just happens to be in the middle of a huge research project on spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. And so we're very lucky to have him as a guest on the podcast to talk about spiritual growth today. And let me just tell you, he shares some insights from his research about spiritual growth that I have never heard anywhere else before. And so let's just jump right into it. Here is my interview with Dr. Dave Wang on What research tells us about spiritual growth. Okay, so today we are talking about spiritual growth. And I think this is a topic that is important to every believer. Every person who follows Jesus wants to grow spiritually and is trying to grow spiritually. Uh, But I think at the same time, sometimes maybe we feel like we're not sure if we're growing spiritually or we're not exactly sure if we know how to grow spiritually. Like what does spiritual growth really even mean? And so today I have a very special guest who is uniquely qualified to talk to us about this topic. He's Dr. Dave Wang. He is a licensed psychologist and also a pastor. Uh, He's also an associate professor of psychology and pastoral counseling at Rosemead School of Psychology, uh, which is a part of Biola University. And he's also the editor of the Journal of Psychology and Theology and serves on the editorial board for spirituality and clinical practice. And so you can call him Dr. Wang. You can call him Pastor Wang. uh, You can call him Dave Wang. I like to call him Dave Wang, warrior poet. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, Dr. Dave Wang, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jay. Happy to be here. Uh, so I was reading actually your bio before uh, the interview, and I saw some things actually that I didn't even know about you. So one of the things that I saw in there that was um, that just kind of caught my eye is that you are also consulting with the Global Aftercare Program of the International Justice Mission. So I think a lot of the listeners are probably familiar with IJM and that organization, you know, who is working on the issues of uh, ending the global slave trade. And so, you know, it says that you consult with them and that you actually also co-authored their manual on trauma-informed care. So, I I mean, I just, that was something that I didn't know about you and Mm -hmm. I thought that was really awesome that you're involved in that. Yeah, and it's a real honor and privilege to be able to do that work with uh, IJM as well as um, to do trauma-informed care work with congregations and ministry organizations. I, I feel like that's the one of the next waves of our work uh, with churches uh, as mental health professionals. I know we've been doing a lot of wonderful work on things like uh, cultivating self-care. Um, and there's a lot of research on how uh, the care of the self, um, how leading oneself well, including one's emotional life, uh, can uh, be connected to thing, uh, positive outcomes like longevity uh, in ministry and effectiveness in ministry as well. But um, I think a lot of us also realize that uh, some of the reasons why many of us may not be uh, healthy emotionally, some of, well, the reason why some of us are struggling emotionally, especially those of us uh, in ministry, is not so much um, you know our own uh, kind of lack of self-care, but rather because we're placed in organizations and communities and uh, organizational contexts that may not be the most healthy uh, emotionally. So uh, one thing I really appreciate about 
uh, constructs and work in the area of trauma-informed care is that it places more attention, it places the spotlight, not just on the individual's contribution or responsibility, but also the contribution of kind of an organizational cultural uh, towards the well-being and longevity of um, people who work and minister and live within it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's super important. I, I feel like that topic is kind of, I mean, this is a whole different topic. <laughs> Maybe we need to have a, another episode on this, but I feel like that topic has been kind of top of mind, especially there's, a, you know, this podcast that's been really popular, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Yeah, and I think right. that, you know, it kind of touches on a lot of those topics where, yeah, I mean, you have sort of the contribution of individuals to, you know, certain you know, toxic environments and things like that, but also talking about what, what, what is it about the culture and what is it about the structures that are in place that are also kind of contributing to, you know, these things happening over and over again. So, yeah. That's right. Like the question of, you know, why is it that the same churches always seem to draw some sort of grandiose narcissistic leader? It's almost as if a uh, entire church system or in church culture is kind of, uh, it can't operate without uh, that kind of uh, figurehead in their organization. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's, that's an important question for many of us to, to consider. Um, and podcasts such as The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill are, are wonderful um, works and contributions to help us uh, get to asking those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. Well, that was an awesome teaser for the next time that we yeah. <laughs> we have you on the podcast. Now that you've given that teaser, you're you're going to have to agree to come back on and talk about that with us sometime. But so I want to get to our question for today, which is about spiritual growth. Like, how does a person grow spiritually? And the reason why I asked Dave to be on this episode is because he is a, a part of a research project, I think, over the last three years. And he's quickly becoming, if not already, one of the foremost experts, probably in the world, honestly, on the subject of spiritual growth and formation. And so I was wondering, Dave, if you could just kind of share with our listeners, like, what is this research that you're engaging in around spiritual formation and sure. what led you into this project? Sure, sure thing. Yeah, um, like you mentioned, I... Uh, have the honor of uh, overseeing this large research grant funded by the John Templeton Foundation on spiritual formation, spiritual development, uh, spiritual flourishing. And part of the, the aim of this project is to see if, if there's a way for us to um, research uh, things like this using um, methodology from empirical science. You know, and granted, there's limitations to to these method, uh, empirical methodologies, these scientific methodologies, and uh, what we're hoping to see is if um, even with these imperfections and limitations, would it be possible for us to observe trends or observe patterns that might actually uh, lead us towards asking uh, questions that uh, might actually improve and help us understand how best we can support and accompany people who are being formed more and more into the image of Christ. And we're presently on um, year five of a six-year uh, project, a multi-phase six-year project, and Lord willing, um, uh, we're currently applying for funding for another three years where we are hoping to take these questions globally so that we can hear and learn from perspectives um, uh, from our brothers and sisters from the majority world on these questions of spiritual formation and discipleship. Wow, so this, I mean, this is a very uh, long running project. And so I'm just kind of curious, because I mean, you've obviously given already, you said six years of your life and possibly three more, like, mm -hmm. is, is there a kind of a personal driver, personal reason why you wanted to be involved in this kind of study? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I What I love to tell people is that even though I'm a whatever fancy schmancy professor, <laughs> it's not really that big of a deal. We're all human beings. Um, even though I'm a professor, even though I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, I, I wouldn't be these things if it wasn't for what I saw and experienced as a pastor. And I'm still a pastor, uh, part-time mm -hmm. though. And I remember when I was... Um, pastoring uh, in my early 20s, um, I had uh, become so disillusioned and so discouraged by what I saw and how and ha how I uh, had a window into witnessing um, how 
people who have been serving at church for so long, how certain uh, Christian leaders who have been revered by the public, how they yet at the same time had vulnerabilities internally that might lead them to engage in behavior or um, uh, or entertain kind of um, beliefs or th thinking patterns that would lead to horrible moral failures. And, and I think this is a, um, uh, a pattern, unfortunately, that's becoming more and more um, common and more and more publicized of, you know, highly acclaimed uh, Christians and other uh, and Christian leaders of kind of uh, in a spectacular way engaging in moral failure. And it leaves the, the rest of us wondering, like, how could people who know the word of God so well, you know, how can mm -hmm. people who practice so many spiritual disciplines, who have faithfully served in ministry for so long, uh, how can such people still be capable of such horrible things behind closed doors, you know? And yeah. those kinds of questions, uh, the seeds of which uh, were planted, you know, m you know, many decades ago. And as I went to seminary and studied theology and spiritual theology uh, and uh, Christian spirituality, and again, kind of continued my studies in the field of uh, counseling psychology and now I'm doing work integrating those two uh, with science and faith. Uh, I haven't really forgotten those uh, core questions that got me uh, going uh, all along. Of, mm -hmm. And these are questions about sanctification. These are questions about spiritual formation. Certainly things like you know reading the word, uh, obeying the word, uh, praying, all those things that we've learned, that I learned growing up uh, in church, uh, those are still at the core. Those are still uh, vitally important. And yet at the same time, through experience, uh, I've learned that those aren't the only factors at play, that it's possible yeah. to get those things well and yet um, have struggle with significant um, blind spots morally. So, so part of my hope with some of this research is that we can uncover some of those other factors so that we can more thoughtfully and robustly um, support each other through this journey of spiritual formation. So a lot of my work, uh, whether it's academic or research, it, it tends to have a very practical application because my, my heart and my hope, uh, I, I still see myself as a pastor first, is that mm -hmm. uh, some of this work or all of this work can, can really make a difference in people's lives and in people's relationships with God. Okay. And so, you know, the first question I think is really just kind of a foundational question. And it's just, how would you actually define what we mean by spiritual growth or spiritual formation? Because we're talking about how do you grow spiritually, but like, what does that actually mean? Yeah. You know, I think for me, the, the place where it starts and the place where it ends, it actually comes from the term spiritual formation. And uh, specifically on the word formation. So um, that leads us to a, a natural question of, you know, to what end are we being formed towards? And mm -hmm. I think the the clear and compelling answer to that is we're, we're being formed into the image of God. And when you think of uh, all the warnings of Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, as it relates to things like idolatry, um, those are deviations from this you know, core process of us being formed into the image of God. In fact, it's the exact opposite when we're dealing with idolatry. It's us forming God in into our image rather than God forming us uh, into his image. And, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's something that, uh, believe it or not, many of us uh, lose touch with uh, as we go along in this, uh, you know, the journey of the Christian life that, and oftentimes we forget that, you know, that the whole point of this is actually for us to be more like Jesus and to not only be more like Jesus, but to be in deeper union, to, in deeper intimacy with Jesus, to be more like him and to be in a deeper union with him. So mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's how I would uh, define, at least on a kind of a big picture perspective, what spiritual growth and what spiritual formation is. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that. Just very simple. It's becoming more and more like Jesus and becoming more and more connected and in tune with him. So I think that's a, a great kind of simple way to define what we mean by growing spiritually. So I want to talk about your research then. So you're sure. obviously you're still in the middle of this research, but are there any insights that you have already gained uh, from your research on spiritual growth that maybe you can share with us? Yeah, sure thing. So um, what I'd love to share about are um, three of the kind of most robust 
predictors of spiritual maturity, spiritual flourishing, spiritual formation, um, at least uh, that are identified by empirical research. You know, and these are predictors that may not initially sound super intuitive, but when you put a little more thought into it, it it actually does seem to make uh, quite a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. So um, I'll share them one at a time. And okay, the, yeah. the first, I'm ready. I feel like sorry. I feel like yeah, we're getting some like secret information here. So I'm, <laughs> I'm super excited about this. <laughs> sure thing. And um, the the first empirical predictor. And, and when I think when I'm looking at empirical predictors, I'm looking at not just cross-sectional studies, but longitudinal studies. So these are imp- uh, empirical research studies that look at spiritual development over time. So it's not just a one-time thing. It's you know over a period of one year, two years, three years, uh, four years as well, and beyond. And the first empirical predictor um, that's fairly robust is this construct called um, differentiation of self. And this is a construct that comes from Uh, the family systems literature. And so if you're familiar with uh, friends who are marriage and family therapists, Mm -hmm. um, this is the theoretical kind of framework that uh, much of their work is uh, based upon. And this notion of differentiation uh, speaks of um, one's kind of paradoxical relational um, needs that on one hand, as human beings we have this need to be independent and autonomous to be able to think for oneself to be able to assert our individuality Um, and you know that's one side of our relational needs and another side of our relational needs is this need to be connected to be meaning to belong meaningfully with a larger group whether that's a family Uh, group, whether that's a community, whether that's a spiritual community, a church community, uh, we also have a need to belong and to be connected intimately with a group of other individuals. And these two needs are paradoxical, right? So, you know, how does one go about kind of pursuing both uh, autonomy and individuality while also being meaningfully uh, connected and belonging to other people. Mm-hmm. And um, the reason why differentiation of self is such an important predictor of spiritual maturity is because a lot of times we, we, we don't live up to both sides of this paradoxical relational need. So for example, some of us who might be too oriented towards independence and autonomy we might be prone to kind of believe, at least from a, as it applies to our spiritual life, that we, we don't need other people. Like maybe, mm-hmm. you know, we're questioning, well, maybe wh- why are we even needing to attend church when I can read the Bible by myself, when I can study theology on my own, and if I need teaching, I can always just go on YouTube and listen to the latest video, um, you know, video sermon. And, and we might end up, because we, we value our autonomy and independence so much, um, we might shun uh, fellowship with others, and in so doing, we we miss out on this vast uh, context from which we can live out and and grow in our faith. Mm-hmm. And on the other hand, there's other Christians that I know, and I can relate to this personally as well in s- certain seasons of my life, where we, we so value being connected to community, that we so value being a part of a church, belonging to a church, that we almost shun independence and autonomy. And mm-hmm. um, oftentimes you might meet individuals who attend certain churches that you know have a very strong opinionated head pastor. And you know even if the head pastor says something that may not be completely biblical or may, not, may be more a matter of opinion, it's almost as if the entire church just adopts whatever is said, not because it's true, not because it's biblical, Biblical, but simply because they their belonging to the church community means so much, their group identity means so much that they've uh, foreclosed in their own kind of critical thinking that that they're not interpreting and reading the Bible for themselves. They're just kind of you know trusting the head pastor or whatever spiritual authority to essentially do it for them. And mm-hmm. needless to say, that's that's also not a uh, a pattern that is conducive of spiritual maturity as well. 
So I think perhaps one thing you can say here is that spiritual maturity is uh, a spiritually mature person is one who is meaningfully connected to other people such that you know other people can speak into their lives and at the same time they can also think for themselves and they can read and interpret scripture and relate to God uh, by themselves both at the same time. Yeah, like not falling off into one or the other extreme of being just completely like a, a solo maverick Christian, um, but also right. at the same time not being just kind of falling into sort of the group think. And, uh, and you know, I mean, one thing that I was thinking as you were sharing that about the, the community piece is that, you know, maybe in some cases uh, or in a lot of cases, churches and church leaders actually promote having maybe mm-hmm. an unhealthy sense of devotion to whatever it is that that church or that leader is promoting, um, probably Mm -hmm. for self-serving reasons. And so, you know, you kind of, the culture is actually pushing people to be overly, you know, overly committed to to the group think. That's right. And, you know, I've encountered many, and I think this is understandable, but I've encountered many Christian leaders um, who lead churches that have uh, church cultures that essentially just reinforce this kind of blind, you know, sheep following whatever the leader says, you know, and mm-hmm. the moment people uh, in the congregation might raise questions that I feel could even be legitimate or you could be reflective of them actually taking seriously what's being taught in church. It's almost as if that kind of questioning, that kind of critical thinking that is so important to really owning your faith, that that kind of uh, thing is often discouraged in churches Mm -hmm. in favor of like, oh, okay, well, the leader said it, I'm just going to do it, you know, without asking any questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to be fair, like, I don't think, I think the vast majority of pastors and church leaders, I think the vast majority of them aren't doing it to be intentionally self-serving or intentionally right. to protect the church. I think the vast majority of Christian leaders, you know, just think that they're doing their job. They, they think that they're helping their flock learn to submit to authority, learn to, you know, have faith and things like that. So I don't think that, I don't, I don't think usually there's like some sort of nefarious reason behind it, but even with good intention, sometimes, yeah, they are actually the ones who are promoting a culture that is not good for their spiritual growth and spiritual maturity of their congregation that yeah exactly yeah and and you know a few other points and reflections from this differentiation of self concept is uh, i think it, it it actually is quite congruent with uh, trinitarian theology you know this idea mm-hmm. of of god, the godhead being uh, both kind of independent autonomous and also uh, interconnected you know and mm-hmm. how both of those things are even modeled in the personhood of god you know, yes. and there's this um, wonderful quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book uh, *Life Together* that also captures this kind of paradox of independence, autonomy, and connect social connectedness. And he says this: "Let him who cannot be alone uh, beware of community, and let him who is not in community beware of being alone. Each by itself has profound perils and pitfalls." Uh, One who wants fellowship without solitude plunges into the void of words and feelings, and the one who seeks solitude without fellowship uh, perishes in the abyss of vanity, self-infatuation, and despair. And, you know, one of the reflections that I've uh, been thinking about during this season of COVID as it relates to what Bonhoeffer just said is that I feel like perhaps uh, COVID has exposed some of the deficiencies in how many of us Christians here in America have been discipled, such that, you know, when we are unable to physically congregate together, you know, in church, it's almost as if we, we see it as a threat to the faith itself, you know, that, mm. you know, how can, we, how can we live out our faith? How can we be Christian if we are not meaningfully connected, you know, physically connected in community and, and doing our kind of communal spiritual practices together? And... And I feel like in times like this, and every now and then we, we will encounter seasons of life where we more or less have to do this, it's it's really not necessarily a threat to the faith, but rather it's a pivot from uh, the, the Christian spirituality that's lived in community uh, towards the, the kind of Christian spirituality that, that needs to be lived in solitude before God. And, and I feel like perhaps what we've been seeing in the last year and a half or even two years is 
you know, perhaps people have been discipled well in uh, living out their faith in community, but perhaps we have not discipled people well in how they can live their faith in solitude. Um, The second empirically robust predictor of spiritual maturity, spiritual flourishing, you know, spiritual formation, according to the uh, empirical science, is um, intercultural competence. Hmm. So, you know, one's sensitivity, one's capacity, one's competence in navigating cultural differences uh, with other people. And I found this result to be super interesting and super uh, thought-provoking. Uh, Because a lot of times people think of, you know, diversity and intercultural competence and stuff like that as, you know, either outside or, you know, tangential or antithetical to the Christian religion. It's almost as if, like, efforts towards these ends might be kind of either a threat to the gospel or irrelevant to the gospel. And and, and when you think about it, um, it's actually baked into the faith you know and there's several ways in this is in, in which this is true uh, the first of which being um, that our relationship with God is fundamentally an intercultural relationship you know and I would even add you know our relationship with scripture is similarly an intercultural relationship I mean that's yeah. why we have, you know, in seminary, that's why we have to study, read books, and take classes on things like hermeneutics and biblical exegesis. I mean, uh, the, the culture in which the scriptures were written are different from the cultures in which we live right now, and there has to be some sort of kind of navigation of those um, differences. And mm-hmm. you know, we have whole areas of study in theology and hermeneutics that help us do that. But um, more fundamentally, I think it's very fair to say that our relationship with God is fundamentally intercultural. Like God is imminent, but he is transcendent. You know, he is beyond us. And um, I think something that many of us here in America need to be reminded of is that God's not American, right? (laughs) And, you know, and the more we think God's American, uh, the more we think he, he votes like us or thinks like us and, you know, values things like we do, Um, the more we have to honestly call into question, like, to what extent do you actually know God? And again, this goes back to what we talked about earlier with, you know, either spiritual formation or idolatry. Like, are we being formed into God's image or are we shaping God out of our own cultural image? And I think Mm -hmm. that's a a, a profound and uh, important question that we all need to ask, especially in our current historical context. Yeah, it's, I mean, because when you first said that, that intercultural competence is a, a key indicator of spiritual growth or spiritual health, it, the, the connection was not obvious. But now that you kind of explained that, yeah, it does make a lot of sense that that would be kind of a, a key attribute or a key indicator of some, someone who would be able to really not be so focused on their own their own think. <laughs> we talked about group think and now th- talking about our own think and, and being sort yeah. of trapped within their own mind and their own mindset, but to be able to really uh, humble themselves and learn from God and learn who God is and to be molded into the image of, of God. So yeah, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. And, and that's why spiritual formation is a, it's a journey because we're being molded and shaped and formed into the likeness of one that is very very different from us and uh it's a long journey to get there you know because but as humans with human sinful nature we we tend not to let go of our attachments our cultural attachments or other attachments uh very easily and the third uh empirical predictor of uh, spiritual maturity is this construct that we call, um, that a lot of social scientists and psychologists, we we call it religious questing or religious quest. Hmm. And the idea behind religious quest is this idea that, you know, we see um, our, our spiritual life, we live out our spiritual life as a, um, as a journey. It's not a destination. It's, we don't see it as a destination that we 
you know, that we successfully reach, you know, on this side of heaven, you know, as long as we're alive on this earth, we're continually on a journey uh, towards uh, being formed into God and towards knowing God and being in relationship uh, with God. And because we're on this continual journey and this continual quest, things like uh, thinking critically, things like asking tough questions, even things like um, engaging in doubt and critical thinking, mm-hmm. the, these things are all part of the journey, you know, and for someone who's seriously uh, engaged in religious questing, we, we see things like questioning and doubt as positive, you know, these are mm-hmm. good things. These are signs and indicators that I'm really taking seriously what what is being taught and, and I'm going through that due diligence the necessary due diligence for me to um, really make this faith my own, you know, and really thoroughly understand uh, not only what I believe, but uh, why I believe it as well. And and relatedly, people who are in uh, engaged in religious quests, they're also open to change, you know, their religious ideals and beliefs. It's not to say we're going to throw out, you know, the entire system or throw out the baby with the bathwater, but, but, but there's also this humility of, you know, well, because I'm still in process, because I'm still on this journey, I'm almost anticipating, I'm open to the possibility that um, even though God is always right, um, that perhaps my understanding of God may not always be accurate or correct. And as such, I'm not as attached to them in a, in a very kind of ego-laden way. But there's this humility of, well, you know, if uh, if, if God wants this corrected, you know, far be it for me to um, to be defensive about this. So, um, and then the last kind of uh, one of the last characteristics that I like to um, that I often will think about when I think about religious quest is an ability to engage in deep existential questions without simplifying uh, these questions in without simplifying the complexities. Uh, in mm-hmm. these questions, to, to recognize that these questions are profound, they're mysterious, and even though we may come upon some answers, we, we don't oversimplify things to such an extent where it's like, okay, I found the answer to this, because we all know that no one has found the answer to these things, and a lot of these mm-hmm. answers to these questions will not be possible until we see God face to face. You know, and yeah. like, would you uh, so kind of around that, like, would you be able to give like an example of, of like questions that may, maybe we might be tempted to oversimplify them? Yeah, certainly. So um, I remember uh, growing up, uh, you know, attending Sunday school, you know, almost every Sunday. And um, there was always, uh, at least in my church upbringing experience, there was always one or two individuals in our Sunday school that would always ask those really tough philosophical, you know, existential <laughs> questions and, uh, you know, stump our Sunday school teacher, you know, and, and again, kind of going back to like that question earlier of like, you know, what kind of culture are we reinforcing? A lot of times these are the, the, the kids that uh, are uh, punished, you know, are kind of, mm-hmm. you know, critiqued, like, you know, why are you asking those questions? Can't you just believe, you know, uh, yeah taking whatever you know is taught just like the other good good boys and good girls in <laughs> yeah, church stop causing you know? trouble and, exactly you know like they were they're little, they're the ones that are labeled as the troublemakers so they're going to ask the questions on like the hard questions on things like how does god's sovereignty and free will work you know like mm-hmm. you say that god's good all the time i mean you know parents get divorced people die early like how do you explain that you know and um, and even the most well-trained theologians and philosophers, I mean, they have a lot to say about this, but um, I, I think especially for those who have thought about these questions deeply and for a long time, they don't, they wouldn't have the audacity of saying they have an answer to these questions, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, they have perspectives and considerations, but nothing to that would suggest that these are, you know, done deal, like, you know, I, I figured this out, you know? And... There's also this, uh, like, like I mentioned earlier, there's there's a humility, you know, that is missing yeah. when people talk about these things as if they've figured it all out. Um, and I feel like there's something about spiritual maturity um, of, or of maturity in general that, you know, that you know enough to know what you don't know. And mm-hmm. when you know enough to know what you don't know, 
you will often uh, that will often be reflected in how you talk about these things that you use much more humble and tentative language rather than um, say the the more immature naive believer that oversimplifies because they're you know and it's not necessarily a bad thing it's a developmental thing oftentimes that um, yeah. they're so out of their excitement and out of their kind of honeymoon phase in the faith they they think that they have it all figured out you know and mm-hmm. um, and you know where life and uh, life kind of kicks in over time and uh, from there we have opportunities to grow deeper in maturity and in depth yeah I mean uh, you know a few weeks ago we uh, did an episode about um, deconstructing our faith right mm-hmm. and um, a lot of what you're saying here kind of reminds me, of people who are kind of going through a process of deconstruction. And, you know, I mean, it that's doesn't look the same for, for everybody, but I think deconstruction at its best is really just a closer examination of what you believe and what you have been taught, that's which right. is never a bad thing. And so, you know, it kind that's of right. reminds me of that and, and what you're describing there, the spiritual questing sounds a lot like deconstructing <laughs> to, yeah. for a lot of people and just, just not being afraid to ask the questions and to really dig deep into, you know, what we've been taught and what we believe to see, like, is this true? Does this hold water? Um, and so I appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, just the fact that as churches and, you know, this this podcast is not geared towards just pastors. I mean, you know, this this podcast is geared towards uh, laymen mm-hmm. and and church leaders. But I think as church leaders and as pastors, if truly our primary interest is to create, you know, a community that is helping people to grow spiritually, become more like Jesus, um, be more connected to Jesus, it sounds like then we should be fostering an environment where questioning is okay. Yes. And people don't feel like they're being vilified or a troublemaker just because they asked a question that was hard. And so, you know, right. I think that's a, a super important insight that you're, you're bringing that, that the, the research is showing is, true that these are the environments that foster spiritual growth yeah that's right jay and i and i really like how you've connected religious questing with deconstruction i feel like that's a very uh, accurate and fair uh connection that you've made and um in years past uh as i was deconstructing my faith and i you know and and i'm continually doing it still um Mm -hmm. i remember um being quite misunderstood uh, by many of my, uh, you know, religious Christian friends, where, you know, even though I was, you know, earnestly struggling with uh, deep questions about existence and faith, and that these questions actually ultimately, you know, helped me grow spiritually, you know, over time, that um, they were oftentimes misinterpreted by my my Christian fr- friends as like a warning sign or as a red flag, you know, that Mm. so much so that many of them like were concerned for me, that they were worried that I was losing the faith or that I was doubting or that I was, you know, not walking the straight and narrow. And, and it was, it's, it's really sad to reflect, uh, reflect on this and, and reflect on how even well-meaning people who did care for me and wished for me the best ended up giving me advice that is directly opposed to the very uh, path that the Lord wanted me to follow uh, so that mm-hmm. I could mature. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the, and the reality is that you can't stave off the questions forever, <laughs> right? right? Like right. we can, we can certainly try to, you know, kind of get people to just believe and discourage as much as possible people from asking these sort of critical questions that might nag them in their soul, you know, we might be able to successfully do that for some Mm -hmm. period of time. But the the reality is you can't fight off the questions that people have forever. And really, I think it's just a matter of, are we going to allow those people when they have those questions to have those conversations in an environment that is supportive with other Mm -hmm. believers who maybe have already navigated those questions? Or Mm -hmm. are we going to cause them to stuff it down so that one day later down the line, um, when those questions cannot be pushed down anymore, you know, it's just a catastrophic, (laughs) you know, it's a catastrophic blow um, to their faith. And, Mm -hmm. you know, now they're just completely disoriented and maybe they're not in as supportive of an environment. You know, maybe they've they're not as connected to a church or they're not as, you know, That's right. um, capable of, you know, kind of engaging with other people who are believers and who are mature in the faith to help them navigate those things. And so, yeah, super important. 
Yeah, and, and that's exactly right, Jay. I feel like um, sometimes you know parents and adults believe and, and act uh, as if the best way to nurture faith in the younger generation is to give them a perfectly supportive, uh, you know, religious environment in which, you know, they're always surrounded, you know, they attend Christian schools their whole life, they, they go to church every day, you know, with youth group every day, and they're always surrounded by people who, who believe the same things and think the same things, you know, and, um, you know, and certainly there's goodness in that, but I think what this research suggests, and I think a lot of people's life experiences would would uh, also support this uh, assertion that we're really not setting up these children for a mature faith if they never have to encounter alternative perspectives, if they never have to struggle with their belief. Because whether we like it or not, like you said, there's going to be a time when we can't shelter them and they're going to have to confront reality and they're going to have to confront a, a world that is pluralistic, that has compelling alternative beliefs. And if they've never had any practice doing this and navigating their own beliefs with other people's beliefs without, you know, making up some kind of straw man argument for everyone else and demonizing everyone else, we're, we're setting them up for failure. Like we're yeah. setting up, up for this glorious crash because they've never had a chance to walk on their own two legs. Yeah. And I mean, I think the statistics of just um, how many people leave the faith and leave the church after they graduate from high school, I mean, would definitely be indicative of the fact that we're not, maybe we're not preparing our, our kids uh, as well as we could to navigate their faith in, in the adult world. Okay, so yeah, man, really exciting. And I appreciate the fact that these are things that are coming out of research and coming out of um, evidence that there's data to suggest these things. And so, I mean, obviously, you've presented a lot of information to us. And so let's try to get really super, super practical here. So kind of just based on what you've shared in some of the research, what are some very practical things like that? my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, or even church leaders, like what can we like start doing today or start implementing in our churches today to help people have a better chance of becoming spiritually mature and growing uh, spiritually? Yeah, I think um, the first step is to think of the question, like, you know, to what end, you know, like what kind of vision of spiritual maturity am I hoping to move towards, you know, that I'm hoping to cultivate among the people in our church. Mm -hmm. And then to kind of almost, you know, reverse engineer it from there and go and ask questions like, hey, um, are our are, are actions and our implicit expectations actually reinforcing just the opposite of that? You know, because it's very common for us to have you know, really good intentions and to do things the way that, you know, we were taught to do and we want to do that faithfully. But as we're finding, especially in, you know, these younger generations, um, a lot of our efforts, uh, these conventional efforts in discipleship and formation are actually reinforcing the kinds of habits and dispositions that are antithetical to, to, to true, robust uh, spiritual maturity, you know. Um, and I think one practical, uh, one practical implication of all this, and I think we've talked about this just a few moments ago, is how we handle those people who um, ask the tough questions. I think if, if we can ch uh, shape our church cultures in a way where we can value these difficult questions, when we can value, like when we can observe people really thinking through these things for themselves, really earnestly wanting to understand and uh, and adopt these beliefs and this faith for themselves, even though it may look ugly at, the, at times, even though it may look, it might be a bit inconvenient, it may not be as smooth as we would like. Um, if we can find ways to encourage and reinforce that kind of behavior and use that as an example of, hey, you know, this brother, just this sister just asked this really tough question, and I'm not even sure I know the complete answer to this. But you know what? I, I really appreciate this question because this is an indication that this person is actually taking this seriously. And I want to encourage all of us to uh, similarly uh, take these things seriously um, as mm -hmm. well. 
Another practical implication, I believe, is to look at you know the Christian life at least through two lenses that we talked about earlier with regards to the construct of differentiation. You know, the the part of the Christian life that is meant to be lived in communion, in fellowship, in uh, belonging to others, and also the the part of the Christian life that is that can only be lived uh, alone in solitude uh, before God you know, in silence and uh, alone. And to to think critically about all all that we're trying to cultivate, all all our efforts in discipling people and cultivating spiritual maturity, are we preparing and equipping our congregations not only to live life in community, but are we also preparing and equipping them to live uh, the Christian life in solitude, alone, mm. before the Lord. Um, and I feel like many of our church programs are oriented towards the, the very valid dimension of the Christian life that is done in community and, and done with others. But we perhaps may be missing the mark and, or we perhaps may not be giving enough attention to the other side of, you know, what does it look like for us to live out our faith uh, alone? And this is where we might learn so much from our brothers and sisters who live in countries where it's illegal to be Christian, where they have to be underground. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's one of the reasons why the faith in those areas of the world might be so vibrant because they, they understand what it is like. They understand the importance of living life with God, of, uh, of living out our Christian faith alone or in secret, you know, Mm -hmm. and, they don't have the same luxuries that we have to, to, to worship together in public openly. Um, and yet we often find ourselves lacking in, in formation and depth, whereas other uh, parts of the world may, may not lack in the same way. Yeah. So then do you think in terms of like helping people form that the solitary faith aspect, would you say that that maybe is where some of these like spiritual disciplines that we always talk about are coming into play, where it's like having that personal study of scripture having that personal prayer life. Yes, yes to all of that. You know, okay. Are we equipping people to read and interpret and apply scripture on their own? Um, are we equipping people to engage in prayer? And, and prayer, there's so many different forms of prayer. It's not just petitionary prayer. There's contemplative prayer. There's meditative prayer. There's like, you know, Lexio Divina. You know, there's lots of different forms of prayer. Um, but are we uh, cultivating an, an interior life that is not completely dependent on them being at church uh, mm-hmm. with them, you know, being surrounded by Christians, you know, so in those seasons where they may not be surrounded by Christians or they have not yet been plugged into a church because they are attending college or they had to move for work, do they have all that they need to to continue walking with Jesus, even mm-hmm. with when they're not as uh, deeply rooted or tethered to a Christian community. And I, I like I like what you suggested there, where, you know, I mean, I, I think most churches are encouraging their members to engage in spiritual disciplines. Like, I think most churches are telling people, yeah, you need to read your Bible, you need to pray. But I like what you're saying there, where it's like, okay, but can we coach them and give them tools to know how to do that like okay don't just tell me yeah you need to read your bible (laughs) but like can you teach me how to like read it and observe and and interpret and and you know what do i do when i have questions and and things like that or with prayer like how do i pray (laughs) you know it's funny like i think if you've grown up in church or if you've been a christian for a long time you forget that when you first become a believer like if somebody tells you to pray you're like not really sure how to even do that (laughs) right you know like okay what does that mean like how do i how what am i supposed to say you know and so giving people very practical tools and say well here's you know several different kind of methods of prayer that believers have practiced over the centuries right and you know you can try them out and see if there's any particular method that works for you but you know to really like some specificity Mm -hmm. to the the call to practice these disciplines i think yeah that's that's a great insight yeah agreed and 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 the only thing i would add to that would be um when we teach the mechanics of prayer when we teach the the specifics of prayer 
for for there to be a diversity of approaches, a diversity of um, specifics that we offer, because um, uh, because sometimes um, we oftentimes will become more attached to specific forms of prayer than we are even attached to God, you know, and we really need to keep God at the foremost, where prayer is a means to attach to God. Mm-hmm. And yet, oftentimes, we become so attached to the method of prayer that we kind of leave God on the wayside, you know. And the reality is that there are going to be seasons of life when certain kinds of prayer might be more uh, rich and beneficial and uh, relevant um, and, than others. And it will change over time. You know, sometimes God will answer you more clearly and you can learn more about him by engaging in petitionary prayer. Other times it might be more contemplative prayer. Other times it might be more simple prayer where I'm just walking down the street and I'm just kind of spontaneously speaking to God or or, or receiving words from God. Um, And I think another kind of uh, indicator of maturity is that I, I can, it doesn't really matter to some extent, the, the exact you know method of prayer, but I've, I've grown to be flexible in relating to God through different ways. It's like, I hope this isn't like lame for me to use a basketball <laughs> analogy, but you uh, know, no, if, I always <laughs> appreciate a basketball analogy, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, uh, maturity as a basketball player is about flexibility. So I mean, even if you have the best jump shot in the world, if that's the only thing in your game, that's not going to be a good thing. You know, I think you need uh, you need to be able to have a jump shot, a hook shot, a post up and a three, you know, like the, the more you can vary it, you know, with your left hand, and your right hand, like the more um, the more robust uh, your capacity will be to score the basket uh-huh. and make a basket. And similarly, um, in the spiritual life, the more uh, comfortable we are in connecting with God with, in different forms of prayer, the less reliant we are on any one specific way of connecting with God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Wang, along with being a, a scholar and a, a pastor, yeah. is also a pretty good basketball player. So that's <laughs> so that's where these analogies come from. But uh... <laughs> The last thing I wanted to share is... Um, uh, um, one of the the most uh, core characteristics of people who are spiritually mature, it comes down to the notion of freedom, and that uh, you know mature spiritually flourishing individuals, spiritually mature individuals, are those that act and choose the course of the course and direction of their life in freedom. You know, they're they're doing it uh, out of their free will. They're 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 choosing it freely. Mm-hmm. Not reluctantly, you know, not out of pure duty, not out of, you know, obligation, not because the rest of the church is doing it, not because it, they th- believe they should do it, not because, you know, people in their life group or their accountability partners are doing it. They're, they're choosing this for themselves, even if other people don't choose it. And I, I want to encourage us to also consider, like, can we find ways to cultivate this in church? Because I I feel like in so much of my spiritual upbringing, and I know this was not intentional on behalf of the pastors or the religious leaders that that were encouraging this in me, but but so much of what I was raised in was out of peer pressure and shame. You know, like, you know, if you don't do this, you're not a good Christian, you know, you you don't want to be that, or look at everyone else is doing it, like, we're going to do it all together. And, you know, therefore, I'll kind of go along, you know, and, and I think developmentally, uh, some of that can be appropriate, because we all need kind of an initial inspiration, some initial scaffolding and support to, to engage in practices and behaviors and habits that haven't been formed yet. But at some point, it has to be internalized and it has to be driven not by external means, but uh, by internal means. And Mm -hmm. for us to think through deeply of how we can make that pivot for those uh, brothers and sisters in our in our congregations that might be ready for that pivot. Yeah. And it seems like really the only way to make that pivot is to give people freedom. (laughs) That's right. right. The only way they can decide to choose something is by actually having a choice. Yes. Well, Dave, man, just uh, my mind is a little bit blown here with uh, some of the stuff that you've shared and just some of the insights that you've been able to gain uh, from the years of research that you've been doing on this. And so I think the research that you guys are doing is just so 
worthy and so needed in the church. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what other insights you guys are able to glean for believers and for the church out of this research project. But uh, you know, I just want to thank you again so much for taking time to just share this with us. I feel like we got like this sneak peek that, you know, I don't know if you guys have published anything yet, but I feel like we got this sneak peek into, you know, this gold that you guys are getting out of your research. So I appreciate you giving us, giving that sneak peek to us. Oh, you're very welcome and my pleasure. All right, so there it is. Man, I wasn't lying to you guys. Dr. Wang is the real deal. And I'm just so thankful for the research that he and his group are doing and just really bringing these insights that are backed up by empirical data. And so my take homes from this conversation are one, that if we want to grow spiritually, then we have to make our faith our own. And the only way to really truly do that is to fully examine it and not to be afraid to ask questions. And churches and and church leaders, we need to make sure that we are developing a culture in our churches that allows and even encourages people to really take a deep look at their faith, even if that means asking hard questions and to be a place that is safe for people to do that. And not to judge people who ask hard questions as rebellious or troublemakers. And also I see that the spiritual disciplines still matter. Because as Dr. Wang was saying that maybe sometimes our churches are really good at discipling people in the community aspect of faith. But not so much in the individual aspect of faith. And really the way that we're going to grow in that individual faith is through the spiritual disciplines. Studying the scriptures for ourselves having our own prayer life, the journey of personal sanctification and the, and the practice of repentance. And so the spiritual disciplines still matter. And maybe a way that our churches can help better foster the spiritual disciplines is to really train believers in the specifics of how do I study the Bible? How do I pray? And lastly, just the insight that intercultural competence is a major factor in people being able to grow spiritually. And so just exposing ourselves to people who are different from ourselves and environments that are different from our own, perspectives that are different from our own, and how that can actually help us to be better students of the Bible and better students of God, because God is not like us. And if we're not able to get outside of our own culture and our own perspectives, then we are likely to make the mistake of molding God into our image rather than allowing ourselves to be molded into his image. So great, great stuff. I want to thank again, Dr. Dave Wang. I've included his bio in the episode description, as well as some links if you would like to connect more with him. And as always, if you guys have any questions or feedback on this episode, please leave us a message. You'll find a link in the episode description. And if you want to support the podcast, please give us a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts. Give us a follow on Spotify, or you can buy me a cup of coffee. And the link is in the episode description. All right. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you guys next week. For more Daily Sabbath content, please be sure to follow us on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also follow us on our Instagram account, Daily Sabbath.